Hi friends, uh, welcome back to the channel. Um, in this episode, I actually invited Jay uh, to give a presentation and do a, a sharing on two companies. The first one is Palantir, uh, second one is C Limited. So he actually provided like a prepared a couple of slides uh, and to walk through with us his insight and his analysis of the companies. And then we will have some Q&A along the way just to make it more interactive for, for all of you. So I will pass it to Jay uh, to walk through with us the presentations. So let's first talk about Palantir. Palantir, um, in case viewers um, are not aware what they are doing, so this one slide actually briefly, very briefly summarize uh, what they do. Um, basically, uh, Palantir offers two solutions, uh, one for the government and one for the commercial sector. In a very layman term, they actually help to... Um, they help entities to make sense of um, very big and unstructured data. Uh, end of the day, uh, with this software provided by Palantir, companies should be able to make decisions based on all this large data. So it's applicable for military and uh, business. Lah. And um, Palantir has been working qu quite exclusively for the US government for the longest time, I think more than 15, 17 years. And it's only recent years they expanded their <clears throat> offering to the private sector. And... Um, the last point is my personal view. La. Like their uh, rapid adoption by private sector could be likely due to their reputation with um, uh, with the government. Uh, personal, personally, I think it's quite cool though. They actually work with so many of those um government organizations like, you know, those CIA, FBI, uh, Special Ops Command, etc. It's like those spy movies. So I thought it's quite cool. Um, So the next segment, we will talk about the good um, the tailwind about Palantir. Then we will go through the the not so good stuff. Then of course along the way, uh, Bunti, you can chip in your comments or questions, or we can, you know, just exchange views, lah. Okay. So first up, uh, the good stuff about Palantir. Um, I just did, did a quick check on their latest earnings call. Uh, they missed their EPS but beat revenue. So if you look at their revenue growth for both commercial and government, I think it's still quite, quite not bad. I wouldn't say super impressive, but I think it's not bad. Commercial 17, uh, government surprisingly still growing uh, more than commercial side, uh, 26%. Uh, Cash-wise, they are quite good in terms of uh, the uh, amount of cash they have on hand and no debt. So um, we could classify them as um, a high growth company still, I feel. And also the good stuff about Palantir is uh, their stock price is already beaten down uh, quite a lot. Um, so the downside could be uh, limited. Actually, I want to, mm. like, before we move on, right, just want to understand um, their business because uh, I, I just now in the first slide, you mentioned about they have all these, uh, like, serve the governments in terms of, like, providing the software to help them analyze the unstructured data, right? So actually, what do you know, like, how many numbers of products do they have is it like just you know like for example microsoft right they should have many many different products right so so they have all the you know the microsoft and then yeah. they have their cloud um, and so on but plenty i just want to understand like is, is it like just so one software or is it like they are kind of like quite a number of different things that they are offering uh to be honest i'm not very sure i didn't know about the found foundry because I, I think they have this foundry. Sorry, uh, go, go, Gotham, Gotham for gov yeah, government. Yeah, they have foundry and Gotham, right? Yeah. But these two also is kind of like the same thing, isn't it? Um, They are different laws. So I think they are customized differently mm -hmm. for the government and the commercial side. Because government, they deal with all the top secret and very um sensitive stuff. So I think they want to um have a share in the private sector. That's why they customize this um foundry for the commercial sector. But in terms of like whether Gotham itself has different um, sub-products, you know, like Microsoft, like what you mentioned, that one I'm not super sure. Um, yeah, so moving on, the good stuff is, uh, I think it's, um, okay, so first of all, they are able to handle highly classified info, which I have shared earlier. So I thought um, this actually means that they actually have a, a significant level of um, quality assurance. Otherwise, the government uh, wouldn't be using them. And could be, could be my personal view is that this high level of credibility sort of earned them some contracts in the commercial sector. I mean, imagine I'm like a salesman of Palantir. Um, if I were to uh, sell my products to the commercial sector during the very initial phase when they venture into the commercial sector, I think I would use, you know, government 
uh, products or, or business as as my uh, sales uh, pitch lah. You know, like in government, I mean, sorry, in Singapore, um, those uh, uh, government projects, I, I mean, vendors who actually did government projects, I think they should be quite of a certain standard lah. That's what I feel. Yeah. Then uh, their competitive advantage uh, is uh, the stickiness, stickiness of the software. Uh, what I learned or at least read online is that uh, the opportunity cost of switching is quite high in terms of the time and money. So uh, once a company is onboarded, uh, yeah, it's very hard for them to switch. Uh, so they will likely stay around. You have any in, yeah. in, inside views of this? <laughs> not, not, How not sticky really, their products? <laughs> not really inside on, on this uh, because uh, I have this uh, discussion with uh, some uh, other friends talking about Palantir. Right? We always say, okay, because the software that they provide is kind of very unique uh, and there's no... Um, how to say like a re- direct competitors or like a easier replacements right yep. so so that's why when, when we talk about competitions right uh, we always say that i mean it's kind of like a big summary is that there's no competitions because there's no other companies to do exactly the same thing but then who are they compete with right for example let's say their customer they use palantir and then um, they're happy with it but they they want to shift to another one because there's no uh replacement so usually what palantir is complete with yeah. is actually the, their customer themselves build, build something uh for themselves i mean they customize it and build something really for their own use stuff. so so that's the that's the competitions that they are facing uh. because you know uh, palantir i think talking about software there's always these things that we we need to like struggle to, to strike a balance uh, which is the first one is that it, it has to be something that is uniform that means you build the same software everyone use the same software. That one is good in terms of scale, right? Basically, you just create one source code and then everyone, you use your codes. Another one is to, to balance is basically how you customize, uh, customize the, the solution such that it will fit your uh, that your your own, your specific needs, Business, right? Yeah. yeah. So so for Palantir, I think it's like, I don't know where they, they are sitting now, but it seems that if the customer wants something that's better and they cannot shift up, meaning that they have to build themselves now, uh, and then this one is really depends on like how big is all these customers. If they're big enough, they have their own budget, why not they do something that's really fit for their own purpose, right? And they might be able to cut costs if Palantir charge them too much. Yeah. Actually, um, I'm not sure whether you know, actually who are really um, Palantir's direct competitors? Ah? Yeah, that, that's the thing. Uh, there's none. <laughs> there's no direct one. For example, you want to say Microsoft? No, they are, they are not. They don't have like this kind of software. So yeah. meaning that if the company, let's say for example, one of the customer, they say, I use uh, Palantir to do this kind of analysis to give mm. me this kind of insights, right? Mm. So they can't find somewhere else to get exactly the same thing. But of course, this is still talking about like uh, you have the data and then you do the processing, then you come up with insights to help with your decisions making, right? But of course you can, uh, build this kind of capability within your own companies, right? Like all those companies with big data team and so on. So so they, they can do it themselves. It's just that, is it better to build from scratch or is it better to take the software from from our uh, external provider and, and just use it, right? Because I, I think for any software business, it's always easier to just buy from the outside. You just pay a fee, at least you have something that's working, right? So mm-hmm. that will be the, the low, lowest bar that you will go for. But the thing is whether it will fit your specific needs or not is the question mark because you might say, oh, um, I look at this Palantir function, this and this, uh, and actually I want it to use, like, like try to enhance it or try to uh, customize it. Y- y- they can request uh, Palantir to do it for them, right? But the mm-hmm. providers themselves also have to think like, okay, if I do this, is it like you are the only one that will need this feature or this feature will be so helpful that actually I, I just build it and all my other customers uh, will benefit from it, right? They also need to make this kind of uh, uh, analysis to see whether it is it makes sense or not or e- economics, uh, uh, w- whether it makes sense or not, basically, yeah. Mm-hmm. So does it mean if let's say those companies that... Uh are now on border Palantir, but prior to that, they are actually just um, getting their, their data team to just do analysis with whatever software or system they have. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it seems like it, huh? Hmm. Because for analytics, right? I mean, analytics is just like you take your data, you process, and then you inform your decisions, right? This one, that 
you, you don't really need AI one. For example, as long as you have data, you do some Excel pivot table, you also can come up with some insight. It's just that the insights that you can come up with is, is mostly those we call the uh, structured data, like mm. there are columns, right? There's rows. Mm. You can do analysis already. But mm. for, for this kind of software, I would say they are much more advanced. They can help right. you process unstructured one, which is a lot harder, but still uh, you can do it one. It's not like, like, like you know, mission impossible. Like you can hire your own data team. You uh hi- hire a couple of let's say like master degree people. They can do some <laughs> codes. They can you can uh, plug some machine learning stuff. Uh, maybe take something from Amazon. You know, like like there's all these packages that can help you with the analysis. So it's it's doable one. It's not like like you you have to use Palantir. It's just that of course you if you have a software provider that really cater for these kind of things. It, it makes sense to use it, right? Then, then it makes sense. <laughs> it's just yeah. like that only, right? Yeah. I think end of the day, when they engage Palantir, the outcome should be um, efficiency. La. Like um, they must be able to achieve certain level of efficiency and and of course, uh, more conclusions that they cannot achieve without the software. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense for people to onboard this uh, this software. Ma. Oh, it's the not so good part. Any any other <laughs> tailwinds or good stuff that you want to add for Palantir? What what do you think about the product? Any good mm. stuff that you want to highlight or share? Yeah, I think in terms of their product, let's say since let's say two years back until now, I, I'm not aware of this any new things that are coming up. I, I believe all this software enhancement is done on a cons- like, like on a frequent basis, right? But I didn't I didn't follow that closely to know like what are the new products uh. for for example if it is a product that is like used by retail customers right say for example like take twitter right uh mm. we, we, we as a user we can see the the improvement but for yes. Pantheon, I i don't know like what are the new things right but uh i think let's say the talking about positive i would say uh in the past let's say one year we we, we saw that they keep on adding new customers so it seems to me that yep the software is already quite good. It's just that now they would just want to package it and just want to run the sales and just want to onboard as many customers as possible. So, so you, you, I mean, at least in the past, I'm not talking about the guidance or the next one or two years, right? Just talking mm. uh, past one to two years. Mm. I, I saw that uh, quite a number of customers, be it like government projects or, or like the uh, corporate clients, right? Uh, there's a lot of contract that they sign. So, so I think that's, that, that's the good things, uh. Yeah, actually, just to add on to that point, I think I have saw um, I've seen people saying that their government's business is getting stagnant, uh, and all this. But then it seems like their government's revenue is still rising, and then on and off, I still see them winning some deals or recontract. So I thought, yeah, on on that part, uh, yeah, they're still doing quite quite well for the government sector. The pattern of the revenues, right? Sometimes it's not like a smooth one. It's kind of like true. Quite- yeah, mm. up and down, up and down. So sometimes it's very hard to, it could be like that specific quarter, you know, government yeah. revenue. Maybe it's happened to secure a few much. more deals, right? Yes, yes. That's true, that's true. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to the not so good. Okay, Um, I wouldn't say the bad, lah, the not so good or hit wins. Lah. So um, though growing, um, I feel the firm is still facing some prof- profit, profit, profitability issues. So uh, they are still unprofitable lah, despite being around for so many years. And uh, their growth is also showing signs of weakening. But of course, for this point, um, a lot of people can argue that actually for the last few quarters, uh, economy has been bad. Lah, and, and a lot of our other big companies are also facing the same issue. So this this particular point, I think um, we will still have to observe lah, for the next few quarters. Um, based on their projection, um it seems like they will fall short of the 30th, uh, 30% annual uh, revenue growth. Again, going back to the whole macro environment, I think a lot of big companies are facing that also. Yeah, and, go, mm, yeah go ahead. Go, let, let me ask you these questions on profitability. Uh. When you uh, talk about profitability, which numbers uh, are you tracking? For, for example, right, are you looking at the net income uh, the gap net income, uh, to be more specific, or do you look at the non-gap one, or do you look at the operating prof income? Uh, which which lines that you are paying attention to when when you talk about like when you focus on the profitability? Um, actually, I, I don't really look at all the. I mean, I don't zoom in specifically. I just look at it in ge- uh, in general the whole company. The the reason I ask this is because if you look at their um their slides, right. 
Actually, they keep on showing like, wow, it sounds like from, I think for the, except for the last three slides, right? The, the, all the front parts is all talking about like they are profitable, but they always use the adjusted uh, measures, which they exclude some, you know, like uh, stock-based compensation and so on. And they call it adjusted EBITDA or whatever. And they, they, they try to, how to say that, try to um, paint a picture that they are actually profitable. But then if you look at the gap net income, which include all these stock-based compensations, they are not profitable, right? And I, I recall the margin is about like close to negative 30%. It's quite a bad one. But then if you zoom in a bit more and you separate out the operating versus the net income, right? Then actually the operating income isn't that bad. So so that, that's why it's, it's like, uh, we are talking about profitability. It's just like a general term. But if you mm, zoom in, you, you look at all sorts of different uh, picture depending on which one I point you to. You know, I can I can say, oh, this is profitable. I can also say that this is like one well, negative thirty percent as no sign of improvement. So so that's why I I'm quite curious. Uh, like generally, when you look at not just Palantir, generally, which one will you pay attention to? Uh? Mm, yeah, I thought that's a very good point uh, because I didn't really uh, specifically look at um, the individual segment that you have identified. But I recall uh, in one of the earnings call, I don't know whether it's the latest quarter or the previous quarter, um, the CEO did mention about like going profitable. Is it in 2025 if I don't recall wrongly? Yeah, so uh, he himself actually did admit that uh, it's it's still not profitable yet. That's why, um, to me, I would classify it as one of the not so good lah, because the company is still not profitable. Okay, the, the last point is um, the not so good about Palantir. I think hedge funds are selling a lot in 2022 um, because actually, as with other growth stocks, lah, they all plummeted. So I actually did a check. Um, there are lesser hedge funds have uh, having sticks in Palantir versus last year, which I think... Uh, this is applicable to a lot of other growth stocks also. Yeah, true, true. Hey, uh, back to the the previous point on the growth, right? I, I recall mm. the guidance. The, their guidance is quite low for upcoming Q4, right? I, mm. I, I mean, the line that uh, stated here, the 500 uh, and yeah. 3 million to 505, right? If you just work backward and calculate, I recall the growth rate is about like 16%. So, so my question to you is that, are you concerned that this kind of drop in growth, right? When I say 16%, uh, I'm referring to year on year, like Q4 versus Q4 kind of comparison. Mm. So initially I record like this 30%, I heard it somewhere also. So so the question now is like, assuming Q4, we get a 16%, right? Are you concerned that this 16% become like a new normal, right? Like, okay, from now on, they are going to grow at, you know, uh, mid teens that we call it, right? About 15, 16%. Or, mm. or do you think that it will like, okay, this is, do, do you see that this, as temporary and they will kind of like, you know, uh, the growth will come come back to above, let's say 20% or maybe even to 30%. So. Actually, yeah, this is a very good question. So it actually applies to a lot of other big tech firms also, like for example, Google, uh, Microsoft. Um, we, we can also see that their, their revenue or their growth has slowed down. So does it mean that um it's 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 a reason for us to be concerned? So when we apply it to here, I mean the way if if we look at uh, Microsoft and Google and then we look at Palantir, then in a way we shouldn't be too concerned because we all know right now the macro is really weak. So uh it is not surprising to see such growth, uh a, such drop in growth. Uh, I think the only one that is really impressive is uh, Tesla. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, I think a lot of other companies are not meeting the initial so-called projected growth rate. Uh, so if you look at it, it from this angle, then by right, you shouldn't be too concerned. But from another point of view, um, I think uh, investors in Palantir should also dive in deeper because right now we are just talking about surface stuff. I admit I didn't really go in very deep. So I think investors really need to look at uh, what are the reasons behind uh, the, the the drop in the growth. Yeah, Is it because yeah. of the macro? And then bec uh, because of the macro, it's also, as in this statement is also very broad. Yeah, I really have to dive in deeper to see uh, which segment is pulling them down or which area are not securing more business. Like for example, NVIDIA, we know, say for example, their, their gaming site is dropping or maybe see their, their gaming site is dropping, but then the other areas are still growing. And then 
then you have to study whether in, in the next two years will the the lacking or the segment that is lacking behind will they catch up? You know what's the outlook? Yeah, I think I I totally agree with uh, your point to, talking about like what's find out what's the reasons right because I think any companies right they can uh, I mean the growth rate is not a constant one they can go up and down right and sometimes even negative growth meaning the the revenue string also can happen to any companies right yeah Th- that one shouldn't be a concern of itself but at least we need to be like really like know what's the reasons say for example just like you mentioned about Google right we, we know that now with this environment all the companies are cutting their uh, advertising budget right so I think if we, if I know that this is the picture right now, um, and less advertising means that less um, you know, less growth for for the advertising revenue, right? So I know the reason. That's why I'm okay to you know just take it like okay, uh, slow growth now. Um, the the growth will come back later. But come back to Palantir is that when we see they got like what. 16%, but I actually don't know whether this is because the, their customer is um, like concerned about the macro, hence cut down their spend. Uh, I really don't know about this, right? So that's, yeah, that's why yeah, if, if right. I, right now I'm not holding Palantir, but if I'm holding yes. Palantir, it will be, uh, for me, it will be a lot more uncomfortable to hold if I don't know what's happening, right? Mm-hmm. But is there is there any way for us to find out or, or like what was the reason? This one, I think maybe you can comment a bit more like, because let's say if you listen to their uh, earnings call, maybe they, did they mention on this? I, I don't know. Um, I didn't listen. So I'm not sure. So uh, just now when I say you're right, uh, not as in like, uh, because customers are concerned or tightening their belt, but I, I, what I feel your point is correct uh, that investors of Palantir should dive in deeper because when you quote that Google example, I thought that's a good example. You know, uh, it's because people cutting down advertising budget, and we all know that all this likely will come back when economy is better and when consumers can spend more. So likewise for Palantir, I just want to echo after you. I think yeah, as Palantir investors, they should um really dive in to understand uh what caused the drop. Uh, anyway, quick disclaimer: I'm not a holder of Palantir. <laughs> just saying. That's why I also don't have very deep info about Palantir. But I thought it's a very cool company to 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 um look at. That's why I, you know, on and off I, I did follow la but then if viewers have more insights, uh please feel free to comment below. <laughs> I would also like to know. So the not so good part is uh they are still spending quite a fair bit on stock based uh compensation la. Though it has dropped, I noticed I briefly look at the the balance sheet. Um so my question is it seems like um Palantir or even some of the growth companies, they favors um, stock-based compensation over salaries for employees. Any views on this, Wunti? <laughs> this one really depends because I think, right, for this type of like, uh, if they are early startups, right, it's common for them to offer uh, stock-based compensations. It's like, okay, um, you come to work for me and then I will give this certain level of options. To and drive stuff. them, right? Yeah. Like, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And you own the company as well, right? So I think yeah. it's good for the companies, good for the employees. And it's also, um, how to say, it? it's it's good for the cash flow also. Um, but the problem is always like, okay, from now, say, say Palantir, right? From now on, whether this business, like how people view it will be more important. Because I, I give you like two, two scenarios, right? So say, for example, if all these employees kept getting all these stock-based composition, they are, they are, you know, like good people and then they are creating good stuff and then it is seen as something that is a good business and is going to grow uh, in the future, right? So there will be all these employees, they get their shares, they will just stay invested, right? In fact, that's the that's how quite a number of, you know, so-called employee, by employee, I mean, including the CEO as well, become a, like a multi-millions air or even billions air, just, just become a CEO, right? It's all yeah. via all these uh, options, uh, stock options. So I, I think that one is is like if the whole things play out well, that's the picture that we are seeing. But let's say if the company is not doing well, right? And uh, the, the employees themselves are the first one, they, they know it, they will know. And you will see it from <laughs> uh, the fact that they are disposing their shares and, and just, just dump it on the market. And hence, sometimes you see that some, some companies, uh, it's not Palantir, I've seen some other companies that you see the stock price keep going down and down. And these are, you know, like the supposed to be the hype companies, you know, companies that is uh, in the AI and so on, right? So you look at the price chart, it's like, how come like this kind of chart doesn't matter? Uh, it, it, how come it looks like, you know, keep on going down and down? It's because all these employees keep dumping the shares. Uh, and, and I would say, have to be careful on, on 
such companies. Lah. So just, just to summarize is that stock-based compensation itself is not like good or bad, but uh, but you need to take this into consideration and be careful because if it is the second one that I mentioned, right? Like all these uh, employees, they get the shares, they just dump it, right? You need to be careful because the the the, the price chart keep going down, right? Let's say from $10 become one, it, it, from one, they can become 0 0.1. It, it, won't, it won't rebound right? because there's a lot of dilutions going on, right? Because for example, for the companies to retain their 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 employees and if don't they don't have like a positive free cash flow, right? Then they what throw they, more shares. Yeah, they, they just have to print <laughs> more shares and, and yeah. then they print more shares to the to the employees. Employee don't see a, a outlook that the profit is increasing, right? Or, or flip to positive, right? They they would they know it, they, they, they would dump it first, right? So <laughs> I think all this you need to piece together to, to inform you on whether like the company is, is good or bad. Nah. So I'll, I'll be a lot more careful when the stock-based compensation is very high. Nah. You need to remember when the price drop, right? They drop by half. If you want to pay the same amount, means that you have to print double, you know? So the dilution can be something that is quite, quite serious one. Yeah. Yes, I, I actually do agree. So say for example, I mean, um, a particular employee has 1,000 shares of Talantia when he was at $20, $30. And then now it dropped to what? $7, $9. So in the past, maybe they just need to sell uh, half of it to maybe get certain amount of money. Right now, they need to dump 80%, 90%. So it brings me to the, the last point. La, like The lower the current price means more insiders need to sell. If let's say they need to raise fund or cash for a certain thing. And it seems like I, I'm not sure their stock price cannot catch up with the insiders selling. Yeah, and, yeah, and because, whatever you pointed out just now, I think they are very uh, valid and real. Yeah, because the insiders, they, they know firsthand. <laughs> they, yeah. know, they know things, one. yeah. But of course, insider selling, uh, we all know now, it doesn't mean that um, it's, it's bad because there are many reasons behind uh, insiders selling. Yeah, so it may true. not be because uh, they, are, they, they know their business is dying or what. Yeah, it could be other reasons as well. But I think what you pointed out over um earlier on is is valid in terms of uh you know over dilution and all this. Okay, personal thoughts. Wow, a lot of words. Uh, let me just um <laughs> okay, okay. So actually, uh like I said, I actually quite like this company because I thought it's quite cool. So I actually started observing it last year around September, uh, where there were a lot of hype. And you know, a lot of um, people are pumping, uh, you know, talking about this, this Palantir company. La. Yeah, so back then it was like the price was 20 plus. Then, but I held my bullets because to be honest, you know, like what we discussed earlier, still not quite sure what they actually do though. Yeah, so and then it dropped to 16 to 18. Then I thought, eh, hey, wow, not bad. Uh, dropped by quite a fair bit. Then that's when I decided to do more research and even did a quick video to to explain uh, so I did a research then I decided to stay out then I did a video on that so the GC is uh, what we have briefly discussed last stock dilution um, stock based con compensation uh, high valuation uh, really high back then uh, in a way quite expensive like an unprofitable and non-scalable business actually this whole um, list of things that I've um, mentioned uh, I think you viewers can feel free to go and Google or YouTube search it. Uh, I think a lot of people can counter all this. Lah. So uh, it is okay. I think uh, different people have different views of all this. Like for example, non-scalable business, some people may think otherwise. Yeah. And then uh, risk, this is my personal view. I'm not sure whether the anybody cover this this particular risk or it may, it, it may be invalid. Viewers can comment. So for risk, right, I thought... um. Any sort of uh, labs uh, for its you know software or security, right? Um, it may it may uh, send the company crashing down, like because um okay of course people can say that they have been around for so many years working with the government so far so good you know more than fifteen years so the chance is very slim, but chance of it happening very slim doesn't mean it's zero percent, and um what I feel is at least for me la, uh, I'm, I'm comfortable when almost the entire um, company's reputation actually hinges on the real reliability and security of this particular software. So just one bridge like right like in the next three or five years, I think it could impact um, the relationship with both government and the private sector. Uh, it need not be say one bridge and then say with, with some military, uh, organization one bridge and then it caused all government to withdraw but say for example you just drop 
20% of the customers, they start pulling out or maybe they don't renew. I think that's quite a big impact really. So in a way, it's a double-edged sword. You remember just now we said that, hey, you know, they have very good brand reputation with the government. Hence, maybe it could be part of their sales pitch when they present to the private sector. But then again, just one day, in, in the next five, seven years, just one breach, major breach, um, it, it, it could cause a negative impact to the company. La. So it's a bit like <laughs> go big or go home. That's my view. You, you have any take on this? Yeah, I think for companies, any software companies have this kind of risk, but um, especially for people who are not in the security field, right? Very hard for us to judge like how big is the risk because it's mm. never never 0%. Right? It, 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 there will be some risk there, but hard, very hard for us to judge. Huh? Okay. Mm. Fair point, fair point. Just more thoughts. Um, like I say, I'm a fan of what they do. But uh, I feel this could be an example of a great company, uh, but then not so good stock. And also, I just wanted to share, like, actually, stock may not be a very fair reflection of the business. Say, for example, Tesla is is really the the one that's performing among all the other companies uh, in this climate. But then you see their price keep dropping. So likewise for Palantir, I thought the things that they do is quite cool. But then end of the day, the stock doesn't pay the full story of its business operation. Like, it only tells the demand and supply uh, of the stock at, you know, at a point in time. And um, I think personal thought is, uh, which I think just now we have briefly discussed, uh, even with the hype, so many people are talking about Palantir. I think a lot of investors still don't exactly know what they what they do. Like, I think there could be some end users out there. But then for a lot of retail investors like us, I, I think you can ask some of the <laughs> back holders. They probably don't know in detail, you know, versus like Google or Microsoft that we use on a daily basis. So yeah, that's that's the issue I feel. Some may claim that they know something, but then do you do they really know? Some may say that, oh, I have friends, I have Intel, I have people in the military, I know what they do, it's really cool. But it doesn't help when majority of the institutions or even investors don't know what uh Palantir is all about. And um I think the gist is uh despite expanding to the private sector, right? They are still quite a secretive company. So um last point is um I don't know, my personal thought could be at this point, they can't really effectively communicate to shareholders or investors how great or uh, what kind of amazing stuff their products can really do. Uh, at least for the retail investors, uh, maybe they can do their sales pitch to the to the companies. But then from retail investor point of view, a lot of us still don't know. And it could be because of the sensitivity nature of their business. That's why they can't really over-elaborate their products. Not like you know Tesla, they can talk about their there are AI, the machine learning, the supercomputer, et cetera, or even other uh, companies when they introduce new products. Yeah, so that's that's my 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 take. La. Any view on yeah. this? On the on the last point, right? I actually think for companies, you said the communications part, right, with the shareholders. I, I, I actually don't think that it is the company's role to promote the shares of the company, you know, like, like, yes, um, they have, they should have an investor relation department. They should answer to the shareholders question. Say, for example, shareholder want to ask like, what, how, how's your operating uh, business, all those things they should communicate. But I don't think uh, they should, how to say it, like package their companies such that uh, people know a lot about these companies and then attract more buyers into becoming their investors, you know. Because as a, let's say if I, I, I'm the shareholders, for example, right, I'm, let's mm-hmm. say I own like 5% of the business, right, I don't think the companies need to do that because if as long as they manage the business well and eventually the business is able to bring in like positive cash flow then what they should do is just like take that cash flow and you can do some sort of like share buyback or you just distribute div- dividends right basically that's how uh investor get the their piece uh, basically they they yeah. risk their capital they get something in return right but to how to say to 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 effect more effectively communicate means that uh want to like for example, like like marketing their shares, right, or marketing their their companies as mm. an investment, right. I I don't think this is the company's role. I'm saying this for Palantir, not just Palantir. It's also for all companies now because I mean this kind of promotion. How I I don't know. I I don't think it works like that. You know, it should be something mm. that okay. Uh, if you know the companies well, I mean, for anyone who want to invest, right, then then you invest. But but 
you are the one that's supposed to do the the homework and not the company should promote it as so called you know so that's my mm. view la. yeah so I, I don't think that the effective uh, communication with shareholder is like a risk it should be something that um like I said, no, it, it should be something like just just to communicate their operating uh th- that's it I think and, and I, I can tell you that not many companies do this do this well as well because like during your earnings call, you see some some companies they are very clear, they communicate well. Uh, if their results is, is bad, they are able to explain why. And then there are companies, uh, their management who kind of like you know, just say some vague things and then try to divert your attention and so on. So so there are many different patterns among the management as well. But but we need to like like look beyond all this and to understand uh the core business uh, whether it's like a business worth to own or it is not right. So that's our role. Mm, um actually uh maybe I should paraphrase. Yeah, like, I think my, my my point is not so much on promoting um like uh the the shares or, or like this is a good investment company. It's more of like uh showcasing their product. Um I, I mean I would draw reference to some of other companies whereby uh say for example NVIDIA they have their you know those like GTC conference, Tesla has their AI day, etc. So I think with all these um conferences or exhibitions or and and stuff, uh, investors can get to know the products more, and then of course they can do their duty to see whether is it, uh, a good company to invest in. But I think at this point, um, Palantir's, I feel like it's a bit hard to, to tell the world what they exactly are doing. Yeah, like for example, Tesla can showcase a lot of things. You know, Cybertruck. Um, yeah their robots, et cetera, et cetera. So it gets investors excited. Yeah. But this one it also depends on whether the business is B2B or B2C, right? Yeah. Say, for right, example, correct, NVIDIA correct, correct. and Tesla, they are both they are more B2C. To the, yes, yeah. yes, you're right. They you're want right. to showcase how good is their GPU so that you as a gamer or you mm, as someone who uses right. AI package, you will be attracted to use their product. So it's a marketing of their products that that is like, that one makes sense, right? Mm. They want to get more customers, right? For mm. Same for Tesla. But for Palantir, because their customer is never like retail customer, right? Their customer are all these businesses, right? And we we are not uh their customers, so we don't know. For example, when they fly like three or five people to the customer uh um board meetings and then explain to them what their software can do, this kind of presentation is not for us one. It's really for the customers, right? So that one, how well they are doing that, I I I can't judge also because I've never seen that, right? So so mm. I think we need to uh, draw a distinction between the the different type of uh products, now. Yeah. So uh, in a way, investors will also have to consider la, if this company or any other company that they want to invest in is a B2B, then uh, they must be aware that uh, these companies can't be like other B2C companies that they can outright promote their uh, products or services to end users, which is the consumer's law. Okay, um, just one or two more slides for Palantir. Uh, hopefully, things will change moving forward as they further uh, explore into the private sector. La. But then um, as shareholders or investors, I think it begs the questions lah, like how long will it take for the stock to have significant gains? Actually on this right now that I, um, as I'm talking to you, um, uh, how should I put it? Because the stock has really beaten down so much, right? Actually just a few dollars up, right? It's a good 10, 20% already. So that's actually a significant gain if if um, investors were to buy now. Uh, not, not financial advice. Uh. Uh, so um, yeah, but for back holders, right, uh, those who actually enter at 30, 20 plus, or even high ends of the tens, um, they may not have patience, lah, and institutions also have clients to answer to. So I, I don't know, at the end of the day, some people may just <clears throat> um, cut loss, yeah, because investors may not want to wait 10, 20 years for something amazing to happen. I mean, I'm over exaggerating here, lah, maybe not 10, 20 years. So, uh, yeah, as mentioned, after one, two years of bloodbath, they may just, just, just cut loss, lah. Then uh, I think yeah, that's the fine. This is the final slide. So I thought um, this is my personal view, uh, not financial advice. I thought it's okay to hold the bullets for a little while. If let's say, um, at least for me like if I'm interested in Palantir, I may hold a little while before putting my money in. Um, to me, um, I don't see a need for myself to hop on the train, uh, to the moon, uh, at a very very early stage. Uh, I mean I can visit it when it turns profitable or, um, because. Yeah, I, I know some people can quote like Tesla, Amazon back then, they were also not profitable, almost going bankrupt. But then there are how many Teslas and Amazons around? 
So as mentioned, don't need to be super early on a good train. You just have to be, um, you know, slightly early, early, earlier, but don't need to be the super, super early one. I mean, you have to consider the risk reward ratio. But of course, this is not applicable if an, an investor is someone who um, go out to look for such hyper growth stock. That's, that's my thought. Lah. How, uh, Munti, will you invest in Solentia? <laughs> <laughs> well, good questions. Yeah, my, I think my, my, I, I, I I think my in, insights or my understanding of the company is mostly based on, uh, you know, like some chatting with friends, like like this this kind of like TCSS review. Um, I didn't do like a uh, a very deep uh deep dive on this company. So so actually, I haven't invested. It's not like I'm bearish, right? It's more like I don't understand. Uh, and given that now, you you see the entire stock market is heading down. So if you want to hold on the companies and looking at the price going down and yet to be comfortable, you really need the, you know, the good understandings that that one will help you uh, have a diamond hands, right? That's so called. <laughs> so so I, I don't have the diamond hands because <laughs> the questions that I ask, right? Uh, usually I ask like, like quite a number of friends also, mm-hmm. you know, there are still one or two things that I think is crucial, but but it's not answered. That's why that's why I kind of like just just uh give this one a pass. Though. Nice. Uh, yeah. I think we all should learn from Bunti. That's really doing due diligence. When <laughs> questions are unanswered, um then maybe hold back. <laughs> I think that's yeah. a good point. That's a good point. I think end of the day, if you really want to be part of the company in terms of being the shareholder or investing in the company, yeah, duty is very important. Lah. I mean try to um analyze as much as you can. Yep. Uh thanks, thanks for sharing. Uh anyway, I I Actually, at one point, right, uh, I must admit, because I was also quite new in the investment world, so at one point, I, I must admit the FOMO is quite real, where a lot of people are um, are sharing, uh, I wouldn't say pumping, lah, but sharing about the good stuff of Palantir, and I also check out their products, quite cool. Eh? So mm-hmm. I almost wanted to enter at like 20 plus. We'll yeah. see how, I mean, things may get better along the way. Yeah, this is what okay. we call the hurt, hurt mentality. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah. I real. almost fall into that. It is the FOMO is really real when you see this whole thing, you know, get being being hyped up, and then people are talking about this. A lot of YouTubers talking about this. Yeah, and the products also quite cool, lah. So I thought, hey, maybe I can you know, write on this. Maybe you shoot to moon someday. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um. All right. I think. On. I yes. think. All right, we, we, we put a close here first so that we, I think we better split into two. Yeah, I also think so. <laughs> yeah. so. So let, let me do a do close a closing, on Italian yeah. first. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, that's all presentations uh, and TCSS between me and Jay on Palantir. So remember to subscribe to uh, Jay's channel if you like his analysis. So every week he has all these uh, market updates and sometimes he will discuss about uh, companies as well. So, so do follow his channel. Um, and we will proceed with the second part of the um, these sessions, which we will talk about C. So I will release this in, in two videos. Okay, um, see you in the next one. Bye-bye.